Um, welcome, welcome back. I recognize both those names. So welcome back to our third uh, Net Zero Skills sessions, uh, session today. Um, today we're talk, um, talking about working together on climate action. So after understanding and getting started with climate action, our two previous sessions, this is the third one. Um, and next week we're going to conclude the, the series with, with talking about climate action. So today uh, it's all about um, working together with volunteers, running events and, and yeah, just collaborating and being a good team when it comes to climate actions. Um, as usual, our, our welcome and introductions, and then I'll be handing over to Nicole Barton, our colleague from CCF, who's going to join, uh, who's joined us today um, to talk a bit about finding and keeping people. And then we'll have a Q&A and a discussion and a short break. And then afterwards, we're, she's going to share a bit more about events, do's and don'ts, and another discussion, um, how, um, how to get started with, with your events. And then, um, yeah, we'll have another quick look at what's next after that. So I'll dive straight in. Um, a quick round of introductions. So I'm I'm Annie. I'm the project manager for Net Zero Skills. Um, I'm a civil engineer by training, but then got sidetracked into project management. And I'm not only working for CCF on this project, but I'm also working for a big engineering consultancy um, and doing things around behavior change, um, uh, sustainability, and that sort of thing. And um, I also lead uh, a plastic free communities group here in Hitchin, where I live, and, um, and a couple of other spin off community projects from that. So I've um, been working with community groups for, for a couple of years now. And um, yeah, really, really great to be sharing my, my um, experience with uh, people in South Cam in, in Cambridge. So, Alana. Hi, yes, so my name's Alana. I'm the manager at Cambridge Carbon Footprint. So I, um, I basically have my fingers in, in many of CCF, CCF's pies. I've been with CCF for um, nine years now um, at this point. Um, my background is in sustainability. So I did a master's in sustainability um, in Australia where I'm originally from. Um, I'll give you a really quick overview of Cambridge Carbon Footprint. So, you know, in a nutshell, our work is really about um, empowering individuals to take action on climate change, whether that's in their personal lives or um, taking a climate leadership role in communities, places of work um, or yeah, outside of the home. And our work is really geared up to be um, inspiring. It's it's practical in nature, but it's also about finding, um, I guess, the positive side of sustainability, looking for those opportunities and, I guess, helping people to um, set and work towards a kind of positive vision for what a sustainable um, net zero future might look like. Um, some projects that we're well known for are open eco homes, where we open up homes that are new built to be uh, energy efficient and sustainable, um, and also the Cambridge Climate Change Charter, so that's really about building a kind of community of climate leaders who are all working towards net zero as well. Okay, and then uh, just a really quick intro into what we mean when we talk about net zero carbon from me. So um, what we're trying to achieve is, is um, the point of net zero where the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions that we emit from our human activity into our atmosphere are the same as the emissions, greenhouse gases that we um, can capture and, and um, get out of the atmosphere. So this balance is what we mean, uh, what we, what we mean when, we talk, when we say net zero. And um, in in Cambridge and Peterborough, we're in Cambridge and Peterborough. Uh, we're not doing that great when it comes to that goal of reaching net zero. Where um, our carbon footprint, our carbon emissions are um, slightly higher than the than the national um, average, and they are also falling. Um, 
less less quickly. So um, we have quite a lot of catching up to do in in our region. And what do we? How do we create our greenhouse gases? So a quarter of of the greenhouse gases that we produce in the UK um, are produced by, by, by consuming food and beverages, um, but then also um, transport like car travel and flying um, and, and, and shopping and um, keep heating our homes and using energy. Um, and then there's also this general overhead that every every person living in the UK has um, called services. So um, and and others, it's um, that just by having access to schools and swimming pools, um, a, um, um, local government and and um, police force and all of these things, um, just that creates an overhead carbon emission as well. So um, looking at the international comparison, we're pretty high up there, obviously not as bad as could be. So um, there are other nations that are worse, but um, if we compare UK, for example, to India or China, the per capita emissions are, are um, really, really high. And if we re um, remind ourselves of our goal um, to reach net zero, um, we re really need to um, get on got, get go on top get on top of that and reduce our carbon emissions. So when we talk about the carbon emissions, um, we often use the phrase um, carbon footprint, and I've already used that that word today. And what we mean then is uh, the emissions that we create by um, consuming food. Um, by using energy and by um, transporting and also by um, for the, the emissions that are caused by the products that we buy when we shop. And so those are the sort of emissions that are on the left hand side, if we think back of the, of the, um, to that graphic that we saw earlier, um, the emissions that we you know, um, release into the atmosphere. And then to reach net zero, we also want to look at carbon sinks. So how can we make sure that we um, extract all of the emissions back out of the atmosphere? And that's what we call carbon sinks. So um, a lot of people think about trees, for example, when we think about carbon sinks, um, but also healthy soils and healthy seas. And all of these things can be can be carbon sinks. So these are really the five areas that you would traditionally focus on if you want to reach net Net zero, reducing the emissions in those four areas of your personal footprint, but then also creating um, and improving carbon sinks. So with that in mind, um, where we want to go, um, we want to reach net zero. And for that, we want to take climate action, either, either in a very small circle in our, in our family, in our um, neighborhood, or in our community, in our place of work. We want to take climate action to um, make sure that we get to net zero. Um, and we've got Nicole Barton here today, um, who also works at Cambridge Carbon Footprint, and she's going to introduce herself in a second. And she will um, talk a bit about how we can find and keep people to help us work towards net zero. Over to you, Nicole. I, I think you're on mute, Nicole. That's a good start. Hello, Joe. Hi, Sasha. This is a cozy group. <laughs> um, so I, I, next, first slide, please. So I am the events and volunteer organizer at CCF. Um, I've been there eight years. Um, we run an average of about 65 events a year or support people to run events. And I have about 400 volunteers. Um, uh, we do things like open eager homes, as Alana said, uh, repair cafes, we do speaker events, all sorts of things. Um, before that, I was with Friends of the Earth for nine years. I did their local groups conference and I also um, helped organise activities. And I translated the national campaigns down to a local level. And before that, I worked for Community Service Volunteers Consulting, um, sort of working on hard to reach communities and volunteering. Um, so next slide, please. So apart from 
the sort of professional bit actually kind of more important maybe is that I'm always a volunteer. I'm always volunteering. I kind of can't not volunteer. Um, so today, the blackbird picture, that was, uh, I built an aviary from an old uh, climbing frame in my garden and uh, I sort of started doing some rescues. And today I've got two little blackbirds and I've called, the female is called Naz Nazanine and I've called the male Radcliffe after the people that were, the, the Nazanine that was liberated today. Um, this represents a book that I sent off. It was like messages from his Nimpington where I live. Um, we're just got people in the village to write messages that went in a big book that went up with our county councillor up to COP. And it was a really, uh, a really great way to give the village a message at such a big sort of important event. Not particularly complicated. It was a bit of a rush, but worked really well. Another, <laughs> another thing I do is um, we, me and my husband, we sort of spend some of our weekends cutting hedgehog holes. Um, we've created a, a hedgehog superhighway in the village of His Nimpington and um, yeah, I, I kind of direct him and he, he does the cutting, he does the hard work. Next one, please. Okay, so I think the reason I'm really passionate about volunteering is that it creates a bridge between the need that exists in society and people that want to do good. And I think it sort of helps you Ordinary people do extraordinary things like I'm not going up to COP because I'm not an extraordinary intellectual person that can sit in a huge conference, but I can gather together messages that can go up to the leaders. I can cut holes for hedgehogs. So I'm not an ecologist, but I can do that sort of thing. Um, so this is, I was featured many years ago. Um, this was Guy Ritchie, who was Madonna's husband, was guest editor at Time Out. And he featured me as someone that kind of made change happen. And I think I still, this is my go-to kind of motto for volunteering is to help people, ordinary people do extraordinary things. Next one, please. Okay, so this is another kind of guru of mine. She is, was called, she founded Community Service Volunteers. Um, she was quite a formidable woman and she was really passionate that volunteering bridged this gap between need and people's need to want to help. Um, she never had any patience with people that said that things couldn't be done. She said, let those of us who, who, who say, let those who say it can't be done, let those of us who are doing it, get on with it. Um, but what she was really good on with volunteering and was saying that it's all about people, Nicole, like it's all about people. And that's really stayed with me. I think a lot of people who have led organizations or been in management positions often then go on to do some a cause later on or something, but they haven't actually engaged volunteers very much. So they just think, well, I'm driven and I've got this cause and I'm going to, you know, that's really important to me, but they don't really think about how you manage people and how you bring people with them. They think the cause is enough, but it's actually not. And it's really important to be, think of people in the round. You know, people need to feel valued. People need to know how much time they're going to give. People need to know what skills they're going to, are going to be valued and all those sort of things. So there's a next slide, please. So people often say, no one wants to volunteer in my community. There's no one I've asked, but no one wants to do anything. And the statistics say that if you take 100 people, or then only 1% of those people will be leaders. So maybe you're a leader in your community. Maybe that's why you've come. Then 9% will get involved if you ask them to do things. So, you know, if you give them a specific task and tell them what it is, they will come along with you. So that doesn't seem like that much, but actually if you're in a village of 3,000 people, you know, there will be 270 people in that village who might come on board with you. And, you know, and the environment is one of the most um, popular issues at the moment. So you are quite likely to be able to find people. And the way that you find people is really obvious, but next please. Okay, the number one reason people don't volunteer is nobody asks them. It's as simple as that. Um, so I'm, I had an amazing email today that I printed out and I'm going to read to you. Um, it's something about asking people at the right time. So we've got a repair cafe on Saturday, a really big one in Arbury. Have either of you been to a repair cafe? Yes? No? Okay. They're fabulous, fantastic. And the network has grown really, really quickly. Um, we've got more repair cafes here than anywhere else in the world. So we're running out of repairers. So I thought, we need to do a repair recruitment campaign. So I'm gonna 
and we've got the cafe on Saturday. So the best thing to do to bring it alive, people, is I made a little poster. It had nice smiley people on it, had a very clear message. We need more repairers. You know, do you have these skills? Come along on Saturday because then they can come to the event and, you know, get a feel, get to know the people that are there, ask the other repairers what it's like. So I'm just going to read this. It's, it's, I've, I've taken out his name and stuff, but it, it, this is like, this is like a volunteer manager's fantasy kind of email to receive, really. So it says, good day, Nicole. My name is Blah, and I'm a Cambridge resident. I'm retired, banking and consultancy, and I'm interested in repairing and fixing most things. I'm not an expert, more a jack of all trades, doing and fixing things around the house and garden. I'd be interested in becoming involved with you. I know that you're having a repair cafe this Saturday. Would there be anyone I could talk to to see if I can assist in repairing? Also, I may be able to assist in back office administration as I'm a qualified banker and I have an MBA. I mean, that's just, well, <laughs> so that, that excites me because that is a kind of dream. And it's just so easy. It was the right recruitment at the right time. Um, yeah, so ask. And then the way that you stop people feeling swamped is to create something called a role description or be really clear about what you want people to do. So next, please. Okay, so in volunteer management or people management, there's the three R's, which is recruit, retain and reward. It's actually much easier to recruit volunteers than to retain them. Dropout rates are quite high. And I think especially around environmental stuff for some reason. Um, so I always say, think about the retention before you start the recruitment, because once you've gotten there, you need to try and keep them um, because you've put a lot of effort into the recruitment. Um, people tend to be uh, time poor. Um, so they really want to go to know that their skills are being utilized and that what they're doing is making a difference. It all sounds quite obvious, but so many people don't do this. Um, so if you, you've got to make your engagement with your group or your campaign or whatever quite attractive. So if it's a Wednesday night and it's raining, like tonight, if I'm not enjoying your company that much or I don't really know what I'm doing, I'm not feeling valued, I'm probably going to stay in. I'm not actually going to come out and volunteer with you. I might do for a first few times because I feel obliged, but after that, I'm probably not going to come. And that's where you get this dropout. However, saying that, there's two things that you can do before you sort of focus on retention. Next, please, Annie. Okay, so recruitment. If you can look at a diary of a year, there tends to be certain, these are fantastic calendars. You can find loads of them online. Um, but if you can tie in your recruitment with particular newsworthy events or particular days, if you have a summer fair where you live or yeah, there's also World Fisheries Day, World Soil Day, uh, World Ozone Day. If you can tie in your recruitment with these days, it really does help because it makes you topical, it makes you timely and you have something to talk about when you go to recruit people. Next one, please, Annie. And the other thing is, if you can, try and do a bit of talking in your community to find out what people are actually interested in. There's no point in me launching, trying to recruit for loads of hedgehog people if everyone's actually interested in uh, growing their own food, you know? So actually spend some time before you go out and recruit, actually listening to community. You know, you can just put something up on social media or you can create a form or you could put something if you have a local newsletter or newspaper, just ask the question what you're actually interested in rather than leaping in and saying, this is what we're gonna do because you will get much more engagement. Okay, next one. Okay, so if you can think about how you want to keep people, creating something called a role description is really useful. It doesn't have to be complex. If you're organizing, you want to organize an event or you're starting a new group, these are some of the most important roles you might want to think about. So communications person, someone to do a bit of admin, someone to do some event organizing. Um, and then you're kind of as and when volunteers, maybe fundraisers, tin shakers, bakers and cooks, stewards, photographers, artists, all these people can be incredibly useful in a campaign, but you might not need them there all the time. Next one, please. So we have role descriptions. Um, I use these to recruit volunteers. So this would be one for um, communications uh, role. Oh no, it's working for the Cambridge Sustainable Fashion Festival intern actually. So it outlines clearly when, when would we like them to come in? What will they be doing? What will they get out of it? What skills might they need? And this is 
yeah, it's 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 vital really because it really clearly communicates what's expected and what they can expect of you. I realise that if you're just starting a you know a small campaign, you're just going to do very something small, then you might not want to go to these lengths. But I don't know, I don't know, Joe, Sasha, do you mind? Would you be up for sharing what you're thinking of doing, or or maybe we can do that later? But it'd be good to know. Next one. Okay, this is what we did in Histon Impington when we started off the green group here. Um, we there was no green group at all. Um, we showed a film. It was called Tomorrow. I didn't think many people would come actually at all. We did it in the local church hall. We had 165 people came along, and I think what we did really right here was we had a sign up board afterwards, and they left their names so we could then contact them afterwards. But we also had another event lined up afterwards, which was a vegan feast. So they weren't just leaving and just leaving with their contacts or nothing else to go to. They then knew that there was another event to come to. And that was then a social event, um, quite a simple event. Um, yeah, and people got to know each other, you know, the sort of whole personal side. Um, then what we did, we, we hired a room and we got everyone to say what they were interested in. You know, what campaigns were you interested in locally? What would you like to do? People put their names down next to those things. And we had a really strong group for about three years until COVID really where we did absolutely loads of stuff. Next one, please, Annie. Okay. Try to meet in nice settings, you know, make it a pleasurable experience to come out and meet and, and do the volunteering with you. You know, um, be friendly, be welcoming. It's amazing how often people don't even think to say sometimes hello when you go to a meeting or, you know, think about the tea and coffee, things that make things enjoyable. If there's no energy for something, just dump it. Just leave it. That's what I really learned. If there's no energy, you you know you're pushing something up a hill and it's not worth it. Always remember to say thank you. Um, however, you can do it by social media or you know a card. Public recognition is always lovely as well. Have a social if you want to, and do give them your feedback. If you get some nice feedback from event, do share it back to your volunteer team because it makes makes it worth it for them. Next one. Yeah, that's it really. Is there any questions? Yeah, it'd be really good to hear what you're thinking about doing and if that made any sense to you. And Feel free to just unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Nicole. That was really good. It was, it was a bit fast for me, <laughs> so Sorry. I would appreciate the, the, the slides later. But yeah, and I don't have a, a specific thing uh, um, in mind to do yet as an activity or group. I, I joined a group in, in a close village and some things you just mentioned um, resonate so they they are doing things uh, probably right oh, good, <laughs> they're coffee when they meet yeah and uh, yeah no um yeah just um trying to find the right thing and get something started or link myself in uh, locally mm. doing doing the survey thing if you can manage it it's a really useful thing to start with you know just to get a temperature take of what people care about locally and yeah what they Exactly. Yeah. Does anyone else want to share? Um, so um, I'm so currently, I'm currently getting, involved. getting involved. Oh, I'm getting oh, lots of I'm feedback there. Feedback there. Um, um, can, sorry, can I ask sorry, everyone, I ask to, everyone mute? to mute? Because I can just hear myself talking back to myself yeah. and it's really distracting. Thank you. I'm so, sorry. Makes me sound like a right princess, but I'm um, sorry. Um, yeah, no. So um, uh, I have got involved through work and I'm actually working at the Botanic Garden. We've got a green team there and um, uh, whilst the Botanics probably comes across as being a very eco-friendly place, um, uh, behind the scenes um, not so um, and uh, a group of us are, are sort of um, building a force to try and um, get some changes made. Um, so, you know, ideas we've got going at the moment, but will need investment, um, uh, you know, things like wormeries and things like new structures that they go up, that they're going to be um, 
uh, living structures um, and, uh, you know, very low carbon footprint structures. Um, so we've got sort of lots of ideas going on there. Um, and uh, we've only had a couple of meetings, so we're quite early days at the moment. Um, and I'm sending out communications after our meetings. Um, and uh, yeah, just sort of summarising and trying to engage people. Um, and uh, I'm also working with the school, the primary school um, that my son goes to. They've just set up an eco council and they're trying to do the eco schools green flag. Um, and I'm working with the deputy head there helping run their, um, their eco council. And so again, that's really early days. Um, we've only had three meetings with the children, but parents are already showing interest and I'm hoping that I'll be able to engage them in some activities around the school, sort of insect hotels and you know, those sorts of things, um, you know, that you need extra help. Um, uh, I'm not a good people person, but um, I did chair the PFA for a while, so I have worked with volunteers. Um, so a uh, little bit of experience on that front but um but yeah just just really keen to try and uh, sort of yeah embrace as much knowledge as possible all around this um so yeah okay i'm going to disappear now <laughs> thanks sasha you're doing loads <laughs> joe hi yeah i'm um, sorry i keep i'm doing a bit of dog wrangling which is why i keep going off off camera <laughs> um yeah, so I'd be um, interested in potentially setting up a repair cafe and I've got a group in mind, there's a group in Wisbeach called Shedders and Fixers, so um, they sound like they might be ideal candidates to actually help with this, um, so that's something that I'm thinking of doing. I've, I've got some experience of working with volunteers because um, about, I'm just trying to think how long ago, it was, I think it's about 15 years ago now, um, I set up a scheme that we've got a uh, fund and district council called Street Pride, which was basically encouraging uh, community groups to go out and do litter picks and that type of thing. Um, and I can remember sort of back then doing that and being really quite worried that either, um, I don't know, I'd, I'd say the wrong thing or I'd be challenged by somebody and I wouldn't know the answer or nobody would turn up to events and, and things like that. And I think now I, I'm, I think as you get older, you, you get a bit more relaxed about this sort of thing. So, you know, and, and you, you tend to think, well, you know, if you do it and only one person turns up, then at least that's one person that's engaged and, and helping and maybe next time it will get more. So I think I'm feeling uh, a lot more positive about things now, but it is, it's easy to fall into that trap of, oh, is, is this good enough? Is it, is it doing what it, you know, what it, what it needs to do or what you want it to do? So, yeah. But yeah, good. It's a really, really good presentation and it really um, some helpful information in there as well. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Abby. Abby. Uh, Birgit, did you want to add anything? Add anything? Yeah, I was just thinking. <laughs> I was. Uh, I just remembered that uh, in that group, um, it's it's often the the first step. Often is just like uh, like talking to people, right? And and um, uh, one one thing I came um, across is like I mentioned because I've got so many books. And I start reading them and then I get distracted, life goes in the way and I'm not reading them. So I thought I was in, well, where was I? It was just about circular eco economy. And I was like, okay, they were talking about book clubs. And I was like, okay, maybe I find some people with a book club. Then you've got this, you've got this commitment, right? So you need to read it. And, but then you also have people you can exchange yeah, your experience with or your thoughts with so so that came out of this group i i um i'm i sometimes joined so we now started a kind of a book club just by uh, t talking about it right so that's what that's what you said in the beginning if you ask so so and so many people yeah. some some people have the same thoughts right and then yeah. it's sometimes yeah. it's it's easy to get get that together get something started yeah 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 hmm. And, and have the next thing planned, like, yeah. Ooh, my audio is quite bad. I'm... Sorry, that's me. Mm, sorry. Yeah, no, the, the, the whole um, pull-through thing, I think, is, is, is quite important. Like, 
always be thinking the next step. What's the next thing we're going to do and stuff. It's a bit tiring, but it just it, it, it retains the interest and stuff. Okay. Just, um, can I just ask about, okay. um, uh, I can't remember who it was, somebody was saying, I think it might have been you Annie, was saying about um, you have a plastic free community. Yep. Can you just explain a little bit around how that works and what that actually means please? Um, yes, yeah, so we signed up to the Surface Against Sewage Plastic Free Community Scheme. Um, so they, as a charity, they've set it up and um, oh, I'm, I'm I would have to guess a number, but I think there are roughly like 400, 500 communities around the UK now. So those are um, either towns or villages or districts even um, who have signed up um, their local community and you try to be accredited as a, as a plastic free um, community. So they have um, a five um, objective plan what you have to do you have to work with your local council you have to work with local businesses you have to work with local what they call community allies so those are schools and clubs and um, churches and just basically social um, allies around around your community um, the fourth one is events so you have to run a couple of events for you know raising awareness and the fifth one is um um, they, it, it's called a steering group, but what it means, it's basically that you also look outside of the, just focusing on the other four objectives, it's that you have um, bigger plans and, and kind of a strategy behind um, your initiative, what you're, what you're trying to achieve. And it's um, all about uh, erasing um, or trying to reduce um, your community's reliance on single-use plastic. So a lot of people, plastic-free always, a lot of people say, oh, but, you know, our, our allotment couldn't go plastic-free because we need, you know, plastic tools or plastic tops and uh, it's not that sort of plastic that we're talking about it's the single use um, single use cups single use stirrers so when you think about um, you know community events and things do you really have to offer plastic stirrers um, that people use to um, you know leave the um, tea bag out of their cup and put in a bin and then dispose of or is it just you know a teaspoon that you use so, so it's just basically identifying those um, single-use plastics that have made them found their way into our everyday lives and you work with the different stakeholders around your community um, and plat and businesses get a little plaque when they've signed up and and erased three items of plastic and community allies um, have to for example um, also try to get rid of uh, single-use plastics but also do events or uh, do a campaign or something so it can be as big or as small as you you know you want it to be it is a, actually a really nice um, comp um comprehensible scheme to work towards it's really nice you get support from surface against sewage and it's um yeah so we are uh, almost done we're still we still need to um chip away at our last objective and then we get uh, hopefully accredited uh, later this year and then um it's off to the next um yeah uh, goals that we set ourselves so you, anyone can sign up to it it's just you have to find a leader who says yes i'm going to lead this this community and then um, you can sign up your, your local town or village or you know whatever level you want to do it at. Okay that, that makes a lot more sense because when I think of um, plastic free you know you think mm -hmm. well the amount of plastic single-use plastics that are in supermarkets and things like that you think well how can that possibly happen in a, in a community but I see what you mean now it's just getting towards that goal rather than yeah. the actual definitive plastic free yeah we we had a bit of um criticism from people around the um the, the the town that they think it's a bit unfair that we focus on community allies and and local businesses and that sort of thing when you know you go into the supermarket and there's so much plastic but um the campaign is really focusing on what you can influence and 
we as an you know as a small community group we we can and that's part of the campaign they will give you for example um campaigning material to write to your local mp or to write to a supermarket and to you know join in national campaigns targeting bigger players like supermarkets but um the the thinking is similar to how we you know in this in this setting approach um, climate action is breaking it down onto the community level and, and working with those people that you can influence. Um, and that is, you know, the local coffee shop, the local um, fish and chips shop that, you know, you can um, just have a conversation with them. Are there any plastics that they can swap out? Um, the local school kids love it it's it's a great way to engage your your local um, school kids um, have a little workshop around identifying single-use plastics in their everyday life and how to replace them um, so yeah it's a good one and it's a conversation opener for our bigger um, topics as well when you know that you can then follow on talking about climate and 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 all the rest I can do a little pitch actually, Annie, for um, if either if anyone wants to come and speak one to one with a whole range of sustainability uh, experts, we've got a human library running um, in Central Library on the 26th of uh, March. We've got a heat pump expert, we've got a green architect, we've got doing green parenting, sustainable food, plastic free living, and you can just and you can just talk one to one. You could you know, you could spend a whole two hours or whatever just going one-to-one -one, asking any questions you have about sustainability it might be really good for your confidence and just have one-to-one -one conversations could be about your own life as well you know questions that are too embarrassing to ask in a group setting or you know just yeah it's, it's quite a unique opportunity so I recommend it if you would like to come book pitch over could I just ask another question sure Sorry, don't mean to hog. Um, so, you know the saying, uh, if you want something done, always give it to a busy person to do. Um, I think that's a, a bit of a worry as well, because, um, you know, me personally, I'm, you know, I work full time and, you know, I've got dogs and hobbies and, and things like that. And I, I just worry a little bit. I'd love to do some of this stuff, but I just worry if I'd have enough time to to do it justice if you see what I mean yeah I think that saying is so so true um I can't speak for yourself but I know with other people if you think about engaging them you know giving those parameters is really really useful I mean I don't know if you could break your job as a coordinator type person down into smaller parts and then try and think about what would those smaller parts involved um and then maybe be less frightening for you if you had a little because if you're someone that says yes like me all the time it is a problem so then thinking it through and pl planning and plotting it a bit might help thank you yeah and, and starting yeah. small as well possibly and, and not yeah. thinking right we're gonna Exactly. Yeah. And actually do what you enjoy. That is a really big thing. You know, it is if you work, it is your free time. And you know, I'm really clear that I don't want to when I volunteer, I don't want to do any spreadsheets, I don't want to do any admin, I'll do loads of other stuff. I don't want to do that stuff. And I think it's fine to be really honest. Um, because it's your free time. And if I don't enjoy it, I'm not gonna come. So yeah. Yeah, I'm I mentioned earlier that um I'm as, as the so I'm the, the local lead for the plastic free communities and then from that we get we spun off a couple of other things like repair cafe and a nappy library and that sort of thing and um and like you said like I'm I'm a really busy pe person working kids and everything else and and I kind of seem to attract all of these initiatives and uh, sitting at the heart of it but what I I'm really what my rule is that I will will never do any of these things alone I will always only start it if I feel I have at least one or two pe people that I can really rely on who will see it through with me um and then and then once we kick it off in a small team. I'm very, I will very quickly kind of grab volunteers to do certain things around these um, 
Um, so for example, the NAPI library, I, um, I only kicked it off because I had two other volunteers who, who I could rely on to see it through with me. And then I very quickly grew the team into six. So just, you know, otherwise it would be too, too much. So I was very, very keen to do the whole growing out the team and, and making sure that it's not only me, the sole mm. kind of contact. I, th I think that's a really good point. Because if you're, if, if I was saying about earlier about going where the energy is, because if you're enjoying it, people want to hang out with people that are kind of a bit more fun and positive and kind of enjoying themselves. So if you're doing something that you enjoy, other people will want to spend time with you and, you know, partake in what you're doing. It's just quite a natural sort of human instinct. So if you're doing something you hate, you'll probably be like, oh, I've got to do this, you know. So it, it's like snowballs, really. So, yeah, I think it's go with the energy and do what you enjoy. Yeah, I've got I've got a, a, a volunteer in our nappy library team, for example, who just loves talking about it. She that's just her role yeah. in in our team. She yeah. is the she, she is the chatterbox who will just chat to people and and be that energy, you yeah. know, that attracts yeah. people, yeah. and and be that fun fun person. Yeah. And and I'm I'm the opposite of Nicole. I love a good spreadsheet. I will love to make a plan and be like the admin person in the background. And I don't want to talk to the people about nappies. I'm just you know head down. I want to get this done, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and and that's the way that we um, we grew the team. We found the strength and. Uh, uh, and the gaps and then we, we filled them. I'm with you on that one Annie, love a spreadsheet. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Time for Paul who loves a spreadsheet. <laughs> um, any, any more questions on uh, volunteers in particular and growing your team? Uh, we did uh, prepare some discussion points in case um, you know we we would run out of things to to say. So I'll just bring them up. Um, so do you know who the people are that you want or should work with for your um, for the things that you would like to do? Um, how would you go about finding them? What are your challenges in finding and keeping your people and what has worked well for you in getting and keeping people engaged? So maybe if you think think back, um, maybe you, you can share any any stories where it worked really well in things that you've previously done. Does anyone have any good examples, previous examples? I suppose um, going going back to the, the street pride groups that I set up, we we it was a council initiative, so we started off. Um, engaging staff and getting staff to come along and help so then we did we used that as a pilot scheme and got some good um press and good coverage around that and then gradually um uh sort of started inviting members of the public to to join different groups um so that worked quite well and i know uh, you know other people are still keeping the scheme going now and they have um annual events where they talk about the projects that they've done and how much litter they've collected and things like that so they're celebrating their achievements um, all, the, all the time which um which is really important as well and i think they're up to about 15 groups i think now sort of in towns and villages around Finland. so yeah it's been really successful yeah i think celebrating the achievements is so important sometimes you're just so busy thinking about the next event the next event the next event you don't actually remember to celebrate your, what you've done and share it and stuff and it yeah it's a shame and and i think nicole that points to what you said earlier about um environmental um campaigns always um often struggling to retain volunteers is because we tend to focus on the problem and not the, the achievements so i think a lot of um especially things like um, climate action groups, they tend to run out of steam just because the task is so big and mm. the motivation runs out at some point. Um, but if you keep you know, setting yourself achievable goals and then celebrate them yeah. when, you, when, you, when, when you get there, I think that will really help your people to stay involved. Yeah. And uh, and do, do you have to have um, 
anything around sort of health and safety and insurance and disclaimers and all that type of thing? It depends what you're doing, I guess. I mean, so because we're we're a charity, we you know we have to have public liability insurance when we run events. Um, but most venues will have it anyway. So if you're going to a venue, they will have public liability insurance, unless you're doing something quite unusual, like a repair cafe. They're they're a bit of a problem at the moment um, since COVID. It, it's got harder. But at standard events, usually you'll be covered. Um, we don't work with volunteers under 18 just for insurance purposes and loco parentis and all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, we always do a risk assessment. I have a risk assessment template I could share with you. Um, yeah, just goes around, you know, using things safely and not, you know, not having people untended with children and all that sort of stuff. If, you, if you'd be interested, I could easily share that with you. I yeah, think yeah. standard stuff really. Annie, what as a volunteer group, what would you have? Yeah, that's, um, that's a bit of the thing with our plastic free kitchen initiative is that we're not um, a body, we, we're not an organization. Um, so we don't have things like liability insurance. So we will always rely on the venue where we are to, to provide the, the insurance. And, um, and we've been asked for the first time the other day when one of our volunteers wanted to go to a brownies meeting, whether or not, you know, she's got safeguarding training and that sort of thing. Um, so it's, yeah, it will come, it, it does come up occasionally. Um, but then again, because we work with a bigger um, charity, we can look to, to them for, for guidance. Um, but you can start small if it's just a meeting and if it's just a workshop if it's a you know film screening like Nicole said earlier then um, it should be pretty straightforward and then once you start being um, it being more complex like a nappy library um, for that we have teamed up with a with an with NCT as an existing charity so we can do all of that under their umbrella and get their insurance and get their training resources and you know their guidance um, to make sure that we've um, we're ticking all of the, those boxes. So finding that's the other thing: finding your allies, finding you know where you can link in to get what you need on in a on a village level. That might be a parish, or in the city, it might be um, you know existing existing hubs. Um, where you can link into, for example, with the human library, which takes place in the library, you know, you can kind of find your find your allies that you can link in with. Okay, shall we um, take a break at this point um, for five minutes, and then um, and then the second part we're focusing on events in particular. Okay, so let's meet back at um, five two. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm um, welcome back, and we're gonna hand over again, yet again, to Nicole um, to talk a bit about. Um, running events, do's and don'ts. Okay, hello everyone again. Um, okay, this is um, one of my favourite events actually, probably about the most stressful event we've ever done. We broke the, we were record holders for a little while and we broke the world record for holding the world's biggest repair cafe. Um, it was brilliant, but it was incredibly stressful. Anyway, this was the moment that we we passed the, the record that was set by the French. So, yeah, it was a good moment. Next, please. Not because the French or anything, just good. Um, <laughs> next, please. Okay. So, I'm sorry if I'm teaching some of you to suck eggs, but I'm just going to cover over events in, in about 15 minutes. So, um, I think probably about 25% of your time with your event will be taken on publicity. Um, so let's start there. I think one of the first things I'd say is create a contact sheet right at the beginning, a publicity sheet that you're going to use because you can just build on that. Um, 
use a platform maybe to share stuff on if with your group so i just discovered padlet it's a really nice way of sharing stuff don't know if anyone's used it but you can put youtube clips on it you can put photos on it you can put links on it you can write on it and it's free and it's so simple to use i'm not particularly good with technology but this is so easy people can respond underneath um yeah i think it's fantastic um, so if you're doing like a communications campaign or you want to send some communications material to other people, you can put it on here and they can just lift it off. Obviously, you can use a Google Drive as well as a kind of shared platform if you want to share stuff. Because um, I'm not mad keen on technology, I've been putting off learning Canva for ages. Um, this is uh, a design suite. It's a free uh, program and it's so good. It's so easy. You, I've literally learned just watching some YouTube videos. Um, you can make, it resizes all, everything you need, so it resize things for Instagram, for Twitter, to Facebook, for posters, it just literally, you can create something and it will just resize it into the right format for you, it's very easy to use, I'd really recommend it if you're going to do some publicity. Um, I think posters still have a place, I don't know how many people they bring along to events, but they keep your profile up and they keep your brand out there. Um, I say getting, getting into other people's newsletters is key. And knowing when other organizations have their newsletters coming out um you know feed into their schedule and they'll they'll do the publicity for you um obviously facebook twitter and instagram i think they're probably what gets most people along to most things unless you have your own newsletter um if you invite along your mp that will very often brings the press along um the mp has links shared if an mp comes to something they'll tend to uh, do a press release about it and that all mps press releases get picked up by the press association which means that your event will get picked up by the press association and then it kind of just has an amazing ripple effect um so or if you invite along a vip that will often sort of draw attention and, and get the press along to your event um making your event timely is another key thing if you can make your event newsworthy or timely so that it's actually news rather than just we want to run an event at a certain time you will get so much more coverage um it's a newspaper and you know they they do like news um, that ties in with something that's happening in the wider world or locally um so that would be my top tips i think you press releases are still really good um but it's quite rare that they'll, the press will send down journalists anymore um they'll sometimes send down a photographer um, what they prefer is that you provide all the content that they need, definitely put in a quote and definitely send along some nice pictures. And then you've got quite a good chance of getting in. Um, I think expecting journalists, you know, the, the local press is, is, is uh, on its knees in many cases and they just can't afford to send someone along. Um, so if you make it easy for them, you'll get the coverage. Next one, please. The other thing I say is, start collecting so this is some of the coverage that we've actually had um recently um yeah so you know quite visual um i think it was timely i think this repair cafe was held during um, national repair day so you know it's got the sort of wider hook um some things just take off on their own so this was a couple who had an eco wedding um got picked up everywhere M mail on sunday uh, all sorts of places i don't think this would get picked up now because it wouldn't be such a thing so that's about timing. This was probably, I don't know when it was, maybe four or five years ago. And it was quite something, you know, to, to they used um, excess food and all the clothes were uh, reused clothes and they had no disposable cutlery, all that, you know, it was exciting then, but it wouldn't be such a big story now, I guess. Next one, please. Okay. Another top tip I'd say is start taking really nice photographs straight away. Um, photos are invaluable for your posters, if you write in reports, if you want to send anything to funders, for your social media, like just start taking pictures and they will be invaluable. I mean, I, I go to our photo library probably every day I work of the week, really, three days a week, I'll go to the photo library every day for some reason. So this photo, often of people, is the strongest thing, like there's such a nice connection here. They're happy, he's repairing, obviously, she's happy, he's repairing his, her iron for free, but there's just a lovely connection in that picture and it's intergenerational, so it's kind of telling a story as well. Next one, please. 
these are some other pictures that I have used countless times um, and they've all got something in common. Um, you know, they're people doing stuff. Uh, they're people with a connection, looking at each other. Um, they're happy. Uh, yeah, just the one with the food. Uh, that was at a food festival. Just, just happy. And then obviously, you know, you do need the more sort of self, the, you know, the explanatory ones if you're going to do sort of more technical subjects. So this is something we'd use for open eco homes. But a lot of our open eco homes pictures, they're also about people engaging, talking, sharing, stuff like that. Next one, please. So heritage photographs, I don't know, I don't know where you live, but I think, if Joe, if you're in Water Beach, but um, climate action is really motivated by heritage and conservation in the countryside. So there's a re report called the, was the Outreach Project, and they said that these values of, you know, of, of heritage and conservation are really important in motivate, motivating people to look after the environment. Um, so a while ago in Histon, we, I think, were celebrating the end of World War II, and we had to find some images from the village from that time. Uh, was, you know, I can't remember exactly what it was. But anyway, I found that this image of um, the old bike club in the village, and it's just a fantastic, I found it in the um, Cambridgeshire uh, Archive Library, and it's at the old Histon and Pinton Bicycle Club. And it's just such a fantastic picture. I mean, I, the two guys at the front, I don't know what they're wearing. Um, but it's just so atmospheric, it's just wonderful. And it's I guess quite a fashionable look now as well, the whole kind of vintage cycling thing. Anyway, I used this um, as part of display in the village and we had other photographs of the, the biking event and they all had these handlebar moustaches and stuff. And people loved these pictures and that led the Histon Implant Bicycle Club to be started. And that now has I think, a few hundred members and they go out all the time. Um, but it was these photos actually that really grabbed people's attention. They were just put up on a board and people were really curious. And um, you know, then a load of work went into it I wasn't involved in, but the photos really captured people. Next one, please, honey. Okay. Any sort of event, it's really good to do something that has like curb appeal. So if you sort of have a few display boards and you know you have to go right up to the display board and you can't reread it, you might not have that much impact. So I love this. Um, this was an event from Cambridge Sustainable Food and in Market Square. So you could be walking at the other end of Market Square. You would know what's going on here and you might want to come and have a look. Um, you can read it from right across the square and it's really colourful. It's you're kind of curious when you see that. Um, and it's also interactive. So they were actually asking them to do something. So this kind of event, I think, is, is really effective. It's, it's quite simple, not a lot of effort, but it actually really works. Next one, please, Annie. Yeah, so this is a stall, Cambridge Carbon Footprint stall. So it's quite hard at events to stop people because, you know, they might have kids with them or they want to go to the fairground or they want, you know. So having some sort of opener to start a conversation with people, you know, what do you think about fast fashion? Or, you know, have you got some places where you live that you'd like to put on our green living map? You can see a map here that we made a, a map of sustainable North Cambridge. So we identified some spots on the map, but then we asked, the fair was held in North Cambridge, then we asked other people if they had things to put onto the map. So having an opener or a reason to talk to people, surveys are really good as well. So if you go out with a clipboard and say, can I just ask you what you think about it? Immediately people are more interested in than just sort of stopping and, you know, they can feel a bit awkward. Next one, please. Okay, so at any event, Again, what I went back to before, try and create a really welcoming atmosphere, um, create a space that people can talk in and they can meet in. So Girton Repair Cafe, they, um, they have a, the PTA organises a repair cafe, but they have a, uh, a toy hospital in it and they have little, some children, they manage the toy hospital. And so other children bring the toys, broken toys into the toy hospital and they have a little sign that just says toy hospital. Um, then they have the allotment society provides soup uh, made from the vegetables on the allotment and they serve those and it just creates this kind of lovely fat me you know a lovely atmosphere that people want to return to again and again um, and you can make a place look really simple when we have a repair cafe we we'll often bunting works wonders to make something look <laughs> cozy we'll just put some jam jars and a few clippings of some you know wildflowers or whatever and on the jars on the table just makes it a nice place to come. 
things are definitely so this was a we did a bike powered screening of a film called triplet de belleville which is an animated film about cycling it's a wonderful film um so we work with partners outspoken who uh, lent us their bikes that generated the uh, projector and we had a, a three hour i think it's a three hour film um wonderful event quite a lot of work to do but really worth it um stuff i'd avoid is generally don't do stuff in school holidays unless it's a particularly themed one that's you know about attracting families in the holidays um definitely don't try and do anything in the week of september after school term starts because people's heads are just in another space um try and always check the events calendar don't clash with big things you know don't clash in cambridge with a big weekend or the cambridge half marathon because you know, one people might not be able to get to you and, and yeah they'll be distracted as well all the press and the publicity will be focusing on those of as well. so you, you know you'll find it hard to get any coverage next one please any now this is what we've learned this is a really important thing it might sound really silly but um when we've had the odd repair cafe where we've had a wide opening it just means that people just stream in and they can sometimes just go straight up to the repairers and plonk stuff down the table or they go straight to the cafe and we don't get to talk to them we don't get to engage with them they don't get to take away their disclaimer um we don't get to sort of talk to them about what's happening on the day or introduce ourselves or anything so having a really narrow entry point is really important and also then again at the end have a narrow exit point because then you can collect any feedback you know, or maybe they're just writing some feedback on a, on a you know chart on the wall to so ask some feedback but also if you have your donation bucket strategically placed a very narrow point with someone next to the donation bucket you know asking politely you know have they had a, a good time or whatever um you might get some donations um but if you just let people stream in and stream out of your event it's um yeah it, it's much more difficult and you don't get that connection next one please honey um, a great thing about Zoom has been volunteer briefings. So with any event, I try to do just a short briefing. Um, often you have a group of people coming together and they don't know each other. And it's just nice to introduce each other to one another before the event. Um, you can go through the health and safety stuff. You can you know, find out what people prefer to do on the day. I've got a couple tomorrow. I'll just find out who wants to go in the cafe, who wants to do the admin, who wants to do this and that. Um, it's brilliant and it stops you having to create that time at the beginning of each event to have to do that briefing. Next one, please, Annie. Um, yeah, I think if you've done quite a few events, it can be quite tempting to become quite complacent. Um, you know, I, I, I know where the, the fire extinguisher is or, you know, I know where the first aid box, I've been here many times, but actually you might become confused, you might forget. We, we had an incident where I was... Um, in my local volunteer group where we did some wax wraps um you know the alternatives to cling film and stuff and we've had the the person practiced it at home and everything and it was fine we went to do it at the event it was a green christmas we were making green christmas it was a green christmas fair she put it in the oven um i won't say where but a very beautiful local building and because it was a gas oven the whole the, the things caught fire and uh yeah it was really scaring um we had to run to the extinguishers we had to know how to use them and it just has made me really you know even though i've been there 20 years that that could have ended really 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 badly um yeah and we managed to put it out but it's not something i could have particularly foreseen i wouldn't have been an accident i could have thought would happen but luckily we knew where the stuff was and we we, we put it out <laughs> next one please annie okay um this is alana who's with us today talking to david attenborough um, we introduced him to uh swishes which he thought were a jolly good idea and uh, we also introduced him to repair cafes um there's no reason that picture's there apart from it's just a lovely picture um so just try and get feedback if you can you know they would say what gets counted counts it can be a pain and it's you know the end the end of the day and you're tired but if you can put the figures together it's really great to share them it'll help your fundraising it will help with your publicity and all really great feedback for your volunteers as well to know that they've sort of made a difference next one please This is a fantastic, um, one of my favorite events that we did. We did a, 
a ration challenge um, where we it was all about cutting down your waste and cutting down the amount of meat that you ate and the amount of food that you wasted. So we created these little ration books and people signed up to a ration challenge and they had little boxes that they filled in and stuff and they had to try and stick to the, the levels, the rations that people ate. I think you could sign up for a week or a month and that was it. And it went viral. I mean, it, it was so popular. So, you know, be really creative if you can. That was really lovely. Um, when you run an event, make sure you get your message across, you know, have displays about the information about climate or waste or whatever it is. Um, have info sheets to take away. Um, we have a calculator that you can use. It's an online calculator if you want to learn to use that. It's a good tool to use with people. You can take people through their carbon footprint in about 15 minutes at events. I mean, something you could maybe do at the Botanic Garden, Sasha, or... Um, and one of the really big things to remember is do remember to pull your visitors through to the next level. So we talked about volunteers and sort of keeping them going. So a lot of time we hold events and then people just disappear. They have a great time and then they're gone. So make sure that you're thinking about the next thing you're going to do with them because it's so tempting. You're tired at the end. Um, you've put all the effort into the event that you don't then pull them through to the next level. Um, so you can pull them through by a newsletter sign up having an upcoming event or, you know, asking them along to an introductory drink or meeting like we had in the room where people wrote about what they're interested in. Um, but the pull through, I think, is one of the most important things you can do with your event. And we don't always do it. And uh, we should. Next one, please, Annie. OK, and linking up with other people. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but this is something called the Cambridge Resilience Web. Um, and it lists, it, it's, it's in a digital format and it lists all the uh, groups that operate in, in and around Cambridge. So it could be around food or waste or um, biodiversity, uh, all sorts of things growing. So there's one page that you can see all the groups that exist locally. And then there's another page for all the groups that exist within the university and you just click between them. This is the kind of spider's web diagram, but there's also, if you go to it, it's, it's, it's just, just look up the Cambridge Resilience web and you can, there's all the details, all the groups, how to contact them, what they do and all that sort of stuff as well. So you can, that's a fantastic resource if you want to get advice or link up with other people that are doing similar stuff to you. Next one, Annie. That's it. That's it. Um, if you've got any questions or if you want me to send you any templates or, you know, if you want to chat about things further after, I'm very happy to do that. Just email me and we can set up time or I can send you stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Again, lots of input there. Um, so yeah, fire away. What are your questions for Nicole? Well, you've got her undivided attention here. Um, can I ask, um, what would your advice be about um, how clean your act needs to be in order to start trying to talk to other people about cleaning up their act? Do you know what I mean? So say we're talking about somewhere like the Botanic Garden, for instance, um, you know, it's sort of, it, it, at the moment our focus is very much on our internal operations and cleaning those up. Yeah. Um, but um, there's certainly some stuff that we're doing this year and that is looking out to um, change visitor behavior um, with a view to, you know, to, to do with indoor plants basically. Um, but um, you know, there are other things that we're considering um, and there's definite hesitation about whether we can um, preach stuff that we're not actually doing ourselves yet. Someone might be able to answer better than me, actually. Alana's quite good on behaviour change, but I always say progress, not perfection. Yeah. You know, I'm not perfect. I don't do everything perfect at all in my life, but um, I do try my best. And, uh, yeah, Annie, Alana, do you want to say any more on that? No, I think... Yeah, yeah no, go, go Annie. On. No, you go first. No, well, OK. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I would echo what Nicole said you know that um yeah progress not perfection but what that's got to be really based on is actual clear communication as well so you know if you're not saying anything about the work that the botanic gardens is doing 
um, in terms of reducing its environmental impact, that it's, it's not going to come off terribly well. Um, but if you are communicating clearly, and it, this doesn't have to be, you know, a marketing push, this, this could just be, you know, sort of being transparent um, about what you're doing, um, then, you know, you, you, I, I think you're then having a conversation with people. And I think that that is even stronger if you're also, you know, talking about um, where you are now and where you want to be. So acknowledging that there is a gap between you know, what is ideal and, you know, what, what you're doing now. But I mean, also obviously talking about what you're doing to get there. And then, I, you know, then I think you do stand in a pretty secure place to be able to, to talk about what you're doing, the progress that you're making, where you hope to be, and having a similar sorts of conversation with the people that you're engaging with um, about, you know, where they're at, you know, what they could do and, and where they could ultimately be as well. And then I think you're having an equal conversation and that's not going to come off as greenwashing. That's going to come off as kind of a genuine engagement. Um, that that I guess would be my advice. Yeah, uh, thanks. That's really good. That's reassuring because actually that was the advice I went back with when they were saying, "Oh, I don't think we can do it," and I was like, "No, I think we should, and we can be open about where we are." So yeah, that's really really good to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we do have that session on communication next week, which will focus on exactly that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, absolutely, what Alana just said. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's another session I would recommend. Um, uh, Ambition to Action. We ran so this was um, a series of three seminars aimed at businesses and organisations, run uh, in 2021, so last year. And I'll link them um, in the chat in just a second. And we did a whole session on you know communicating around goals and progress and with you know different stakeholders um, aimed at, at different organisations and. Um, yeah, it was a really good session, I think, really useful. It also provides different frameworks, Sasha, so different environmental management systems and different templates, you know, that you can just say, this is where we're at, this is well, where we want to get to, and this is how we're going to try and do it. And yeah, it takes you through a whole load of different options. Some are really simple and some are really sort of in-depth and complex and stuff. So do you have anything like that at the Botanic Garden? Um, so what we're doing at the moment is we're working through the, the university sustainability, um, have these sort of um, awards, um, yeah. we're working through those. Okay. Um, so um, we've achieved bronze, we've achieved silver, but we've still got gold and platinum to go. So that gives us kind of an agenda to work through, which is really clear um, and sort of, you know, points based. Um, so really clear for us to sort of, yeah, work through what we're doing, what we're, what we're needing to achieve yeah. um also coming back to what i said earlier about the plastic free uh, community scheme that is always part of the pledge that we ask the businesses and the community allies and so to to take is not only reducing their own or trying to reduce their own plastic but talking about it and um and, and, and no one's expecting them to be plastic free, completely plastic free before they can start talking to their clients about it and um, or their, their students or, you know, um, or put it in their newsletter. Um, it's really just basically announcing that they've joined, joined the course. And I think that's basically what you're looking at, isn't it? It's not that you have reach platinum level but you've you, you know you're chipping away at it and as part of your journey you would like to take others along with you and that's where the events come in or um yeah 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 absolutely um because we've got a learning team who who can sort of run educational events um and uh, and it's the eco sort of end of those that that we're kind of investigating yeah Any more questions regarding the tips and tricks that Nicole just shared? Can I just ask you, Nicole, where you get your ideas from? Because some of these um, campaigns look brilliant and just something that I would never have thought of in a month of Sundays. I don't know. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I get, I'm quite a creative person, I think, but um, and Alana is too. And sometimes, it, yeah, it just comes out of, sitting in the office together actually um 
we get inspired what other people by what other people do as well. I mean, uh, I don't know, Alana. Mm -hmm. How do we? But we we keep an ear to the ground about what's yeah. happening, and I, in terms of other actions that other groups are running. But I think also to what people are interested in. Um, yeah you know just yeah paying attention to the things that people like and and doing more of those things and the more that you do things you sort of get feedback about what works and what doesn't yeah. work which really helps you to to kind of identify as well when you've hit on a good idea um you just you know from experience one thing <clears throat> that i'll just add that builds on you know nicole's shared a whole bunch of tips i'd add a sort of extension tip which is nicole mentioned um, two things. One, about keeping your narrow exit, you know, for donations. And two, that people um, most often don't volunteer because they don't get asked. And I would say it's the same thing about donations. So if you are looking to um, collect donations, people will not donate unless you ask. So, um, yeah, making sure if you're running an event that you're asking at the end or whatever it is that you're doing, that that is something which is planned in from the beginning as well. It's, you know, how you're actually going to, to make that ask and not, not apologizing for it because people expect it. Um, one, two. So I've, I've got a list of about 40 different event ideas I can, I can send over to you if you want and if anyone else wants. Yeah, I'd be very interested. I love the um, the cinema, um, yeah. the, the bike cinema thing. What was the technology that translated the cycle energy into electricity for the projector? Who who did that for you? Uh, I don't know, Annie. You're, I guess it's some kinetic energy was turned into electricity, but. Um, I don't know, it's just outspoken who were the people. You can hire these things really easily, actually, Sasha. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, so bike pad screen. I mean, so a bike pad screen in Botanic Garden would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so don't, do it when, don't do it in the daylight. I might start with school first and then move okay. on to Botanic Garden with a successful school one. Okay. <laughs> don't do it in the daylight. It was, I did, that was a, no. No, a bit of a nightmare. So I did it in the summer. So it was light until 10 o'clock and we were in a big sports hall and we had to go up on really quite unsafe ladders, very, very high and cover all the windows in bin bags. I had to get a climber in, actually, a solar panel installer had to go and do it. Um, it's just little things that you don't think about. You know, don't show films if you're not in a totally blacked out room because it won't work. Um, yeah. But yes, we there's loads of people. You can hire um, juicing bikes you know, cycle power generator things, all sorts of things. If, if you go to Outspoken, I think they'll be able to put you in touch. They're at the bike depot. We're in, the, we share premises with them, but yeah, you can look them up and just get in touch directly. Yeah, and I'd be really interested in the other event suggestions you've got. I, I also yeah. love the um, uh, the ration book one as well. That's a great yeah. idea because yeah. people do love that, stepping yes. back in time. Um, and actually it's a win-win because they're cutting down on waste as well yeah yeah it's fabulous i think what the, the thing i love about the events we do at cambridge comfort print is they, they make a difference but they're enjoyable you know and we're very non-judgmental um you know we try to meet people where they're at because that's where they're at so if we can take them a little bit further then it's a win um and i think a lot of people who maybe wouldn't get involved because we, we're approachable and it, we, we find easy ways for people to engage that are not, you know, too complicated and, and um, yeah. Um, can I just ask, um, I'm, I'm not actually Water Beach, it was Whiz Beach I was talking about. Oh, Whiz so Beach. Yeah, so oh, right brilliant. at the other end of the county. Brilliant. Um, That's great. So just a question around that. So um, obviously, um, sort of residents at the, the north and the south of the district are, are um, I suppose we've got levels of deprivation in Fenland, um, more affluent, you could argue, in Cambridge. I know, that, I know there are uh, pockets of deprivation there as well. Mm -hmm. So do you think that would make a difference to the type of events that would be um, more popular or more likely to be supported? Um, I think repair cafes are popular everywhere. 
Um, they're just such a win-win because they build community, you know, they get stuff fixed for free and people hate waste. So you, all those things are great about, they also save quite a lot of carbon emissions as well, but not always the first thing that people think about. Um, if you fix a laptop, for example, it will save the same amount of carbon emissions as flying from London to Berlin. Um, events. So I know that uh, if we run, say, a clothes swap or something in an area that's a bit more deprived, we won't get as many people coming to that clothes swap as if we run a clothes swap in a, in a sort of wealthy area, just because people, you know, think they're going to get some nicer gear probably, and, you know, they'll tend to sort of flock into an area. Um, I don't know. Does anyone else have any thoughts on, on that? Annie or Alana? I'd say that yeah. our... So we do a lot of work on home energy and our, our flagship um, project there is Open Eco Homes, which is about, you know, retrofitting and um, building homes which are sort of new and sustain or, yeah, sustainable and energy efficient. Um, and I would say, you know, a lot of the work that we do with that is, a is, is aimed at, you know, homeowners who have some disposable income to install measures. So there is a, a lot of that project that, you know, wouldn't speak to low income audiences. However, we do do a lot of work, um, not a lot of work, we do do some work around low cost, no cost measures um, that, that are more accessible um, and that is also applicable to renters. But I think, you know, they are different audiences and you communicate, you reach them in different ways than, than I think you reach your sort of, you know, more middle class homeowners. Um, so, you know, I think, I think in a way it's easier to, to pick which audience you're working with sometimes rather than trying to reach everyone because people yeah. do have, um, different audiences have you know, different barriers, different, you know, incentives, different limitations, all of those sorts of things. Um, and I think that you really see that when it comes to that energy work, for example, like the difference between sort of having a disposable income and, and not, um, and, and the type of activity you would run and how you would go about reaching that audience. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of his other events that we well, there's quite a lot of work done um, in, in schools around um, creative sort of work. Um, so we're running this Imaginarium at the Cambridge Festival and the idea that, you know, you have to imagine the future, what it might look like before we can start creating it. And that's, that's quite good work to do in schools because kids are quite creative and imaginative anyway. So um, one of my partners, she does a lot of work in schools about working with kids to get them to imagine a different future and using it creatively, you know, try to imagine a different, you know, Cambridge or a different whiz beach. What would that look like, you know, and getting them to model it and paint it and stuff like that can be where you, you know, you work with a partner that's already, I think working, um, finding an ambassador in those communities that you want to work with because, you know, we can come along, oh, you need to do this, you know, we're the greenies kind of thing. It can be a bit, uh, but if you can find someone who's already got credibility and is an ambassador in that community to suggest it and kind of help you run it, you're much more likely to, you know, get some traction rather than being seen as a kind of do-gooder that comes in suggesting stuff. One other theme I think which cuts across pretty well is nature and yeah. engaging people in the natural environment and yeah particularly you know yeah out in villages I think that works quite well but I think it works in Cambridge as well and one idea um, one project which came to my mind is one which um, Nicole and um, uh, the group her group in Histon the sustainability group in Histon <laughs> ran around it was a nature trail um, well, it wasn't, it wasn't a trail, but it was a map that they built, which had, you know, all of the sort of local um, nature spots on it. And they arranged for events and activities to take place in those spots over the weekend and printed off maps and publicised it around the village. And I mean, I, I, I went into a pub with my WI, I, I remember it. And it was great. It was fantastic. And, you know, yeah, the whole village came out. And, uh, you know, I think, Nicole, you said that, you know, people were saying that they had gone and visited green spaces that they you know, had never been, um, been to before. They didn't even yeah. know they were there. Yeah. And, you know, okay, that's not necessarily reducing carbon emissions in and of itself, but it's a great way to engage people in nature. And actually studies show that um, people who um, 
have a stronger relationship with nature are more likely to take action on climate change. And it's also a great vehicle mm-hmm. to sort of communicate with people about those issues, you know, if they're out and about sort of visiting them. So that might be something, mm-hmm. um, yeah, thinking about the connection yeah. with nature. That might work. It's a really, it's a really good example, Alana, because the beauty of that project was as well that it transected issues. So we didn't have to pay for it. We got paid for by our well-being and mental health budget, because taking people into green spaces is really good for your mental health. So we didn't have to pay for it, but because we're good at delivering events, they paid us to deliver this event. Um, and yeah, so wherever you can find that sort of crossover between issues. That is really, you know, that works really well because you bring a whole new audience with you. Um, and the beauty of that was as well. So yeah, exactly, partners again. So we started that project. One of the first things we did was we just went outside Tesco's and we had a big, uh, we showed the green spaces in the village and we just got people to say, you know, them share their memories of the green spaces and what they meant to them. And they were like, oh yeah, that's where I had my first snog when I was 15 that's where I walked my dog, that's where I took my kids when they were babies. And it just made people feel really fond of those green spaces and stuff. Then we led the wellbeing trail. And then because we've identified these green spaces as being really precious to the community, and we had evidence that they were precious to the community, that helped get those green spaces into our neighborhood plan, which means they actually now got some protection, if any, you know, proper protection, if someone wants to build on it. So it was just such a beautiful little project. Um, not too much work for anyone, but just, it was well thought out and um, yeah. I can send you a copy of those maps as well if, you, if you'd like me to. Um, the other example that work, works well in, in our town here um, is uh, just, we've got two reuse initiatives that are really popular across um, different neighborhoods in in the town and also um, in the in the more deprived um, areas of our town so we've got one we've got a Facebook group which is a reuse group and um, and that is really popular and you can see that it's people from all parts of the town and all sort of backgrounds um, engaging with that and it's just basically offering stuff mm-hmm. stuff for free and um, and that and and we don't have many rules, but one of the rules is you're not allowed to sell on, and um, and and that's basically and that's one of the major group uh, rules that we have. It's just basically making sure that everything you give is free and not just you know taking to to sell, and um, and it's really taking off, and you can see people engage with it and use it um, from from all parts, and it doesn't have. And, and you can see people finding bargain gifts for their for the kids they, if they might need them or um, people you know so just going to the page first going to the group first before they buy new oh I thought I'd ask here before I go out and mm-hmm. buy new um, so that is really um, re- a really really successful project really um, I mean it's got it needs admin kind of Facebook admin time but um, relatively low maintenance um started out with a couple of businesses in town being involved in sharing kind of packaging and surplus stock and and that sort of thing and then it it got really really popular so that that um reuse project is really um popular and then the other one that we have we have a lot of food um rescue um initiatives around um our um, so one here in Hitchin, one in one of the villages, and then one in the neighboring town. So a lot of food rescue initiatives. And again, because the food is rescued and it's kind of a charity feel and it's not, um, it's, it's kind of, it's slightly different to a food bank. So people will be, um, will engage with it who don't want, who might need to go to a food bank but they are still a bit too proud maybe to go to a food bank and plus it's not only low-income families but it's it's also um you know the eco warriors going there because they want to rescue food so again you get a really good mix of different people attending these reuse um uh food, food rescue events um um so they they work really well across across the board Any other questions? 
I have got one more if you don't mind. Sorry. Go, go on. It's just all this expertise. It's lovely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you or have you run any um, projects? I suppose it's more than an event to do with um, sort of land share. So people who've got big gardens that um, or that could be used for an allotment, if you like. Um, and then people who who want to work on a lot but haven't got the land, that that type of thing. I haven't here. We did something when I, I lived in London. We did a fruit mapping, fruit tree mapping uh, project yeah. that was really nice. So, you know, people, we mapped the fruit trees that were in our neighbourhood. And so, you know, whenever there was a surplus, you know, you could just go onto this little map and, and you knew who had what and they sort of shared stuff out. But I've, I've heard of the garden sharing, the land sharing, but I've not been involved in the project. Mm -hmm. Transition Cambridge ran a project um, which was garden sharing um, and I I mean this was many years ago so I wouldn't I wouldn't really take this as a great example but they I know they did have difficulty in finding um, people to take part in it um, they have also had, like Nicole said, they, they had for a long time and probably still have a, a map of fruiting trees in Cambridge, um, which can be accessed online. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a good example, let's <laughs> say. Seed swaps, they're really popular still. They have something called Seedy Sunday in Cambridge where people swap seeds, I think monthly and stuff. That's Not so wrong, really. Seedy Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, because I think there's, there's possibly something that we could do around here. Yeah. Um, link to that, or um, you know, if people have got allotments. Um, if if you're on an allotment site, it's easy to sort of swap um, produce and swap uh, you know small small plants as they start seedlings as they start going off. But I think um, there's quite a few people with allotments in their gardens, and I think it's a bit harder to do that. So mm -hmm. yeah, potentially something around that, and potentially something around um, surplus food as yeah. well what to do oh, have, yeah have a look at um have a look at camlets c-a-m let's yeah it's the cambridge uh, local exchange trading system and they exchange stuff i think they might also exchange skills and they might exchange land i mean i don't know have a look and also life is a gift is another website um where they exchange all sorts of stuff on there um yeah okay thank you Any, any other questions around events Nicole shared? <laughs> so we had some discussion points prepared in case you um, wanted to share some of this. Uh, so are you planning to, to run an event? Uh, what sort of event would you consider? Uh, which of the tips will you definitely use going forward? I think that's an interesting one. Um, that would be a good one to uh, to hear from you. Which ones of the uh, and what are your challenges when it comes to events and who can help you? So discussion like, point, Annie. <laughs> so who would like to reply? Um, I think on the tips front. Um, the tips I thought were really useful were go with the energy. Um, don't try and engage people in something that they're just not showing any yeah. interest in. Um, I thought that was really useful. Um, and, um, oh, another one at the same time, for around a similar time. Um, what was it in my notes? Um it's probably set achievable goals and celebrate when you get there. Um, actually, really to sort of break down because it can feel overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think mm -hmm. those are, are both really good, good tips. I think that the, the thing around um, having the narrow entrances and exits never never thought of that before. Um, so that's that's quite a good one um, to think about. Um, 
Yeah, I I got that one from uh, I I never heard of that one before before I uh, heard this from from Nicole, and then I went to an a long to an event um, to be kind of as a as a guest presence. We had a store there, and they asked me, "Oh, where would you like to look be located?" And I was like, "At the at the exit, of course." Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to be able to you know engage with with everyone who's. Um, yeah. He's leaving and just mm. make sure that everyone sees that uh, we were there and be the last thing they see and kind of take away. And um, yeah, definitely a good one that, yeah, you don't really think about. No. Birgit, any um, of the tips that particularly struck a chord? Yeah, uh, so so many and difficult to choose a particular <laughs> one. Made so many notes. Uh, yeah, I think the feedback one is 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 quite good. And um, yeah, I put the put the um, narrow entry and exit point down as well. But um, that wasn't too new because if you been at those events, it's <laughs> quite clear. But yeah, with the I think uh, people also about donations and it's not that I plan an event where, where donations are needed, but I think it's the same when you when you communicate that you're looking for donations or where, where it is and if, uh, that you want donations, it's, it's easier if you if you tell people and don't expect people yeah. Uh, yeah. that they do it anyway. Yeah. No, very, very useful. <laughs> lots of lots of input. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, good luck everyone with going out and trying all this stuff. Sorry, very good. Very good. <laughs> I think, uh, I think Birgit's got a bit of a uh, echo there. Um, okay, then that's um, thanks everyone um, for uh, sharing your thoughts and, and your feedback. So, so what's next? Um, we've got a couple of further reading, um, just if you if you want to um, dive into um, this a bit more, uh, we've got some resources here that you might be interested in, um, particularly that last one, that's our own um, plan and event, so that was, um, a, that's a worksheet that we draw together for the Net Zero Now um, training course last year, and that really um, outlines a lot of the things that it includes a lot of the hints and tips that Nicole's just mentioned and um, and I think it also includes a list Nicole's list of, of um, suggested events and um, so have a look at that one um, uh, so it's a real good yeah um, resource to get help you get started so all of these resources will be available or are available on our on our website. So feel free to dive into those. Um, and then uh, we've got one more session next week, to, uh, focusing more around uh, communications, so talking about climate action. We'll be joined again by um, this time a former member of staff of CCF um, to to share a bit of her expertise around. Um, yeah, using Nicole touched a bit a bit upon um, social media and and Canva and and that sort of thing, but um, we're going to talk a bit more about that and particularly around messaging and and um, choosing you know the messages that you put out um, to make sure that they have the most impact. So um, next next week, same time. Same, same location. Uh, so make sure to sign up and, um, and come along to that last session. Uh, but all the sessions, as you know, are recorded and are available on our website. So you can always go back or share if, with, your, with your networks. Um, if you found the networks, uh, the, the sessions particularly useful, feel free to share them with others and um, it's all available online. And then, uh, you know, you all know my favorite quote. Um, I realized that things can change, but it starts with me. That was Mandy, one of our attendees from last year, who um, felt a bit overwhelmed with the challenge of, of taking climate action. And then um, after attending a couple of these sessions, she, you know, kind of, she, she knew 
uh, she got input from people like Nicole and Alana and myself and and we were able to you know help her to get a bit more organized and, and set off so um, it's yeah it is a big challenge but yeah we can all start doing something uh, now and um, speaking of now if I can ask you to um, now, now after the um, event to head over to our platform i'm going to um, share the link as always in the in in the chat and um, you can um, if you could take the five minutes to to fill it in even if you've done it last week it would be great if you could do it again uh, just to let us know what you thought and um, and thank you thank you very much for attending